Welcome to The Cynical Developer, the podcast that helps you to improve your development knowledge and career through explaining the latest and greatest in development technology and providing you with what you need to succeed as a developer. We've recently launched our Patreon page, which can be found at cynicaldeveloper.com forward slash Patreon. If you aren't familiar with Patreon, it's an easy way for those who are interested in this show to help out by simply pledging a small amount each month in sponsorship. Now that could be as little as $5 a month, which is about £3.80, or as much as you like. You will enable us to dedicate more time creating more content to help you, including videos, more blog posts, and even more shows. So if you can, head over to cynicaldeveloper.com forward slash Patreon and get involved. In this episode, we talk to Matt Watson about the APM platform, Stackify. Matt is the founder and CEO of Stackify. He's been a developer slash hacker for over 15 years and loved solving hard problems with code. While working in IT management, he realized how much of his time was wasted trying to put out production fires without the right tools. He founded Stackify in 2012 to create an easy set of tools for developers. So welcome to The Cynical Developer, Matt. Hey, I'm glad to be on the show. Thank you. Thanks for taking some time out of your uh, busy, hectic schedule to uh, to come on and talk to us about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I'm the the founder and CEO, and um, feel like I'm running around uh, like crazy most days. So, but it's it's all I always enjoy doing this. It's fun. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. So, um, for for those that are out there that have never heard of Stackify, what is Stackify? Yeah, so it's a it's it's more of a developer tool. Uh, it's it's everything that has to do with application performance monitoring. So we we compete with companies like New Relic, App Dynamics, and Dynatrace that are in the application performance management space. Um, we're a little different because we're much more developer focused. Um, so our feature set and um, just the the way that our product works is more aligned to what developers want to see than say an IT operations person would want to see. So we we combine kind of code level performance data with all of your application logging and errors and metrics and all sort of monitoring sort of stuff. So it, it's really all about um, helping developers when they're doing a deployment know that, you know, their their application is going to work before they do the de- before they do the deployment and then, you know, during the deployment, you know, using our product to know that their so- if their product if their software is getting errors or isn't performing the right way and you know c- being able to review how their deployment went the next day and make sure everything's still performing the right way and it's you know it's it's just kind of a developer's eyes and ears into what their applications are doing sure sure so you mentioned a term there which I also alluded to in the introduction I called it uh, APM you mentioned it as application performance monitoring, and I think it also gets called application performance management as well. Uh, could you go into detail about exactly what that is for people that don't know? Yeah, it's you know it's APM as a acronym is is used interchangeably. Um, traditionally, I would say application performance management. The the real sense of APM has has been more tied to kind of the code level performance. So, you know, there's a lot of tools that can tell you that, okay, your application's down or it's not working. Getting down to the root cause of why it's not working is a much more difficult challenge. And really the the best way to do that is through the code level performance profiling. And what that means is basically we we instrument the application at runtime. So when a SQL query gets called, when a web service gets called, all that sort of stuff, we're able to see that in, you know, in real time and know how long those things take. And so traditionally when I think of APM, I, that's what I think of um, is that sort of code level performance. Um, but people also use the term application performance monitoring to mean broadly anything that has to do with monitoring. So it it can be used extremely broad from something like Splunk that just does logging to, you know, New Relic or other, you know, monitoring products. So it's kind of all over the board. Yeah, now I've not uh, used Stackify, um, to be completely honest with you, but I have used New Relic. And the way that we use that is that that used to monitor our live system um, and we could see the errors that were occurring on live, and we would use that to dig into it and fix stuff um, in our dev environments. But we didn't really run it against our uh, development uh, instances or anything like that. Um, is, there, 
Is there any reason why you didn't? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, I think it may have been just down to uh, to licensing more more than anything, really, because okay. um, I know we had to twist some arms just to get uh, funding to uh, to license it for our uh, production boxes. Yeah, so so that's part of what also is is unique about us is we're we're really focused on helping developers from the time they start writing the code to when they test it and when they deploy it to production. So we we have a free product called Prefix um, that is that runs on the developer's workstation, and it's if if you're a .NET developer, it's most similar to Glimpse if right. you've ever used Glimpse. Um, and if you're a Java developer, there's there's some other things that are, that are out there as well. But basically, while you're writing and testing your code on your local machine, it'll it'll give you that instant feedback loop of kind of like, how long does this request take? What database calls did it do? Seeing application errors, seeing application logs. I always say, worst case scenario, it's like the best application log viewer you've ever seen. Yeah. Um. It's it's really slick tool, and and it helps people find weird performance problems or hidden exceptions or kind of anti-patterns like, you know, I, I ran this, I loaded this page and it really ran like 100 database queries and I had no idea it ran 100 database queries. I, yep. I thought it did two, you know, so it, it helps find those those sort of issues and then the that kind of real detailed level tracing that we capture is what we do in, in production as well. It's exactly the same, um, but in production we also aggregate you know, all of that data across every server and every app and provide all kind of reporting and alerting and analytics and, and stuff. But um, but for a QA perspective, um, our product is actually $10 a month per server for QA. So we have a lot of people that use our, our software in, in their yep. QA environments. So right. that's, the, that's the best time to find the problems, right? Yeah. Before oh, yeah. Production. So, yeah, definitely. And, and, and that's what a lot of what makes us different is we're so more so much more focused on the developers from when they start writing the code to QA to production, not just IT operation to you know waits for all the all the stuff to get delivered to them and then they got to deal with the problems. We want to help the developers find the problems before it gets that far. Sure. So what sort of stuff is it uh, is it tracking? Do you get the uh, the full stack traces and and all that sort of stuff so you can you can dig into uh, into those low level parts? Yeah. So for so today we support .NET and Java. And we're next year. We're going to be working towards some other programming languages as well. But if I use .NET as an example, you know, we automatically support uh, .NET two, .NET four, five, .NET Core, all the the frameworks like MVC and Web API and WCF and uh, Nancy and all these different types of frameworks, whatever yep. you use. Um, and then we automatically instrument uh, most of the common frameworks. So things like SQL Server and Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, App Fabric, Redis, you know, all these different all these different frameworks. Basically, anything that crosses a service boundary that you could be connecting to a remote computer somewhere, that's usually where a lot of the performance slowdowns happen. If that's caching or queuing or database or whatever. Um, we like we instrument all the Azure libraries and AWS libraries and all that stuff and um, you know, basically, when your app is slow or, or having sort of some sort of issue, it makes it a lot easier to understand how your code is interacting with other things that could be causing exceptions or or performance slowdowns. Yeah. So we re- we really want to allow the developer just to install our software and it just works, um, and we just automatically support all those frameworks. They don't have to worry about trying to do some kind of custom instrumentation or any of that kind of stuff. We just want it to work. Sure. Sure. Yeah, the uh, the 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 product that uh, that you mentioned before, Prefix, sounds uh, really really interesting, and it um, it makes me think back to one of the products that uh, that that I was working on probably three or four years ago now, and in development with uh, at the time it was just me that was working on the product. Uh, it was it was lightning fast. As soon as it went into live, um, and there was more than uh, sort of five or six people, it, it just got slower and slower and slower and it took a long time to work out what was going on and you were talking about the hundreds of uh, database connections um, on a page and this was making uh, for every page load by every user it was making something like 36 connections to the database uh, separate connections holding those connections open and uh, several hundred uh, queries against the data in there and I think something, something like 
prefix would have uh, pulled that out straight away rather than uh, me having to dig around with performance monitoring within Visual Studio locally just to try and work out what it was. Yeah, I mean, re- you know, ray trace our monitoring product on your on the servers would you know would have made that clear right away, and you know, prefix might have helped you catch it in in development, and you know, we hear stories like that all the time from clients. I, I one of the craziest ones I heard was. Um, there's a company here locally by us. Uh, we're in the Kansas City area in the United States. Um, they do loans, online loans. And when you went to the website, it would prompt you from basically what state you're in. It took 15 seconds for that to load. Right. And then you would select something from the drop down, and it would take 15 seconds to do the post back. And then it would take another 15 seconds to redirect to a page that was specific to that state. So it took 45 seconds to do all that. And they installed our software, and our software said that each one of those requests was doing over 400 web service calls. And they're like, this doesn't make any sense. There's no way. This code doesn't even do web service calls. I'm like, <laughs> dude, dude, it says 400 web service calls. So they had to they had to go to the, um, the, the company that actually wrote the software for them. It was like a CMS system. Like they yeah. were using Sitefinity or something like that or .NET Nuke that had been customized or whatever. And they had to go back to them and be like, what in the world is this? And it ended up being it was supposed to make one web service call and cache it, but it wasn't doing the caching. Right. And so it was causing it to, to do it over and over and over again. And, yeah, I mean, those sort of things just happen. It's just the nature of development. And, um, you know, if, if software never changes, it, it becomes very stable. But, you know, we live in this world where we have agile development, right, where we're, we're making changes and pushing code every week. And the more things change, the more they break, the more we introduce problems and you know, do you, you have to have tools to help know when when these things happen because it's just inevitable yeah. part of yeah, yeah. part of our life, right? Yeah, and I think uh, that that's one thing that uh, everyone out there should uh, should understand that everybody makes mistakes and and their software will screw up from time to time. Um, and another one that springs to mind for me is when I very first started out as a developer, I worked in the travel industry, and um, we were using the Ajax toolkit. With a timer in it to uh, to to work out when a uh, a call had, had finished, and um, that call would ping off a request to uh, to flight suppliers, and um, it, everything seemed to work really nicely. All the developers were um, developing in Firefox. Uh, Chrome wasn't around at that time, um, and it all it all worked fine. What we didn't test was in Internet Explorer, and Internet Explorer <laughs> didn't cancel the timer properly. And as soon as it went live, we had several hundred thousand users on the website, um, and uh, we got a panicked phone call from uh, one of the flight suppliers that we were DDoSing them uh, accidentally from the website. And it was because uh, Internet Explorer wasn't uh, stopping the, uh, the timer. But again, wow. something like this would have probably gone, Hold on, there's a problem here. <laughs> a little bit sooner than uh, than a flight supplier having to ring a uh, a holiday company to say this is an issue. <laughs> right, and and you know to to your example or you know one of the examples I always use is like ordering pizza online. Right, I can go online and order pizza, but if I have any sort of issue where their website is slow or getting in errors or anything, I can just go somewhere else and yeah order pizza. Right, same with same thing with travel. I can go somewhere else and book travel and. Um, it's so critical to know when those things are happening because um, it causes you know serious loss of revenue. The, the example I gave about that loan company, you can imagine they weren't doing a lot of online loans when it took 45 seconds to get their basically homepage to load. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a big problem. Yeah, it definitely is. I think there's, um, there's a statistic. I think, I think you've got uh, 0.05 of a second to impress the person that's hitting your website. You then have two seconds to convince them to click on a link or something on your website to uh, to keep them on there. Otherwise, they'll uh, they'll leave. And if you're taking forty five seconds just to load the page, you haven't got a cat in hell's chance of uh, of meeting any of those um, those points. No, yeah, I mean, you're we we live in a world where we're spoiled by things being fast, and we we don't tolerate anything that takes more than a couple seconds or a few seconds to load for sure. And we're just on to the next result on Google or whatever, right? Just on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you're you're uh, monitoring all this different uh, data streams, bringing it all in, storing it somewhere, does that have any uh, impact on the actual application itself? 
you know, any any kind of profiling always has a little bit of of overhead, and we we only profile really specific methods. So because of that, it doesn't add a lot of overhead. But like a single web request in .NET will call like tens of thousands of methods. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, like all the different things in the pipeline from yeah. all the modules and handlers and all that junk that gets called. And if you instrumented every single one of those, then yeah, it, it would bring the the app you know just to, to crawl. And, and that's what happens if you're using potentially something like Ant or Visual Studio Profiler or some of those things. If you had it. If you weren't doing yeah. any sampling and you had it turned all the way up, that's why they they're so they're really slows your app down. Um, but yeah, we only track, for example, you know, like when a request starts and when it ends, and when a database query starts and when it ends, and things like that. So, sure. because we we only track those really specific things, it you know we usually add you know one to five percent CPU to a server. It's it's pretty it's a pretty low amount, so it's it's pretty negligible. Yeah, well, that's that's good. Yeah, and and you actually mentioned the. Uh the little piece there that really was the cause of, of that question, which was that I know that in Visual Studio, when you uh, you have performance monitored on, the application does grind to a halt at times. And uh, I think one of the uh, the first things you read as soon as you, you Google anything uh, along the lines of Visual Studio slow is turn off application performance monitoring. <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah, I think it, I think Visual Studio these days, the, the built-in profiling it does, like with, in the little diagnostics, uh, panel is is really good. I think the way it works, it samples like a thousand times a second, or yep. a thousand times, or whatever it is. So because of the sampling it does, it it doesn't add too too bad of overhead. But if you've ever used a tool like Ants, um, they have one of the best CPU profilers. I think the Redgate tool, Ants. Right. You know, it's got it's got settings. You can say like, do you want method level or line level detail? Is it sampled or not sampled and stuff like that? And yeah, depending on which one of those you pick, there's definitely a huge performance overhead of that. Yeah, yeah, sure. How long do you store the data? Um, if, if I've got it installed for, for one of my live servers, I guess it's still stored on your, your web server somewhere. Yeah, so the way our software is, uh, in, is installed is it's installed on, on the server, so it doesn't matter if it's in Azure or AWS or wherever wherever the server is, it's, it's installed there, and it collects the data, does some summarization, um, kind of filters down to what we really want, the data that's most interesting, and then it uploads that to us, um, and then we store that data, like the really detailed data, I think we store for seven days, and then the kind of summary data we store, uh, I think, for a year. Right. So, you know, you can go in and see, okay, how has my application been performing over the last, you know, month or whatever, and and see at a high level how it's been performing and stuff over a long period of time. Yeah. So, do you have different um, price tags for for the um, for the data storage for for the application? So, if I wanted that detailed um, data for longer than seven days, could I get that? Yeah, we offer some different data retention. Uh, pricing and policies, um, which some some clients ask for. You know, it's, it's even actually probably a bigger deal on the logging side. So I think our standard logging retention is 30 days. So if somebody wants like 90 days of data or something, then we we can store the data longer and we can right. archive it for them and do things like that too. But um, yeah, we deal with a crazy amount of data. We're we're actually one of we're hosted on Microsoft Azure and we're actually one of their largest clients in the in the midwest of the US where we're at here and right. um we're we we deal with a lot of data yeah yeah so. i can uh, can well imagine well imagine that yeah so is stackify just for web applications or could i use it to monitor desktop applications or mobile apps or anything like that yeah great question so it's it's designed really for all server based applications so not desktop or mobile but if those, if those, if your mobile app is talking to a REST API or something, then you know we can definitely help on the API side of it that it's talking to, um, but which you know is probably a web application. But we do also support things like um, Azure Web Jobs and Worker Roles and Windows Services, uh, different Java uh, background services, basically anything that um, does like the same operation over and over again. So think about like an app that um, reads a message off a queue. You know, yeah. so you can in, you can instrument that app. So it's like, okay, how many times did it read a message off a of queue? What does it do? How long does it take? How many times does that operation happen? So uh, it's it's great for all those sort of use cases. And we use it on our own. Um, we have a lot of Azure worker roles. 
So we have a lot of data comes in and we queue it and then the worker roles, you know, pick up that data and process it. And so, yeah, we're able to see like how many times all that happens and how long it takes. And, and it's the same issues. Like we can collect all the errors out of that. And if there's some kind of performance problem with SQL Azure or Elasticsearch or something, you know, we're able to, to, to detect all that, even for those worker roles. Yep. Okay, cool. So we we touched on there that um, the 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 software, the monitoring software, is installed on, say, my server um, or my instance, wherever wherever that might be. Um, could I install this and have it work on a closed server that doesn't have access to the uh, the internet? Could I set up somewhere for it to send that data to? No, not currently. Um, prefix can work that way um, after it's activated. So we 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 run it sometimes we run into people that work for like the department of defense in the u.s or something like that where they have their laptops aren't even allowed to have internet access and uh you know prefix is free the only thing we ask is people basically give us their email address and activate it and that that's it um so we can send them emails about updates to prefix as updates happen um but yeah they're not even able to do that because they they won't allow any internet access for their laptop so unfortunately we we weren't able to support that but uh, prefix will work in a disconnected mode once it's um, activated okay. the first time. Uh, it, it'll work, um, but our our normal a- your retrace, which is our normal APM product, it it won't unfortunately. But and we do get asked that quite a bit. Sure, sure. Um, we touched on the on the price tag earlier for Stackify as well. Um, does all does uh, do all of the different levels come with a price tag. Is there a free version that uh, that I could use to, to monitor my own private application that uh, that I'm working on, maybe, um, or, or or am I looking at uh, paying for, for for storage and things? Yeah, so our our prefix is free, which is really designed for your workstation. Yep. For on the on the server side, we have um, it starts at ten dollars a month, which is designed for really pre-production servers it doesn't store the data as long it doesn't do alerting um it doesn't do some of the the things that you'd want to do in in production and there's um some more data limitation and throttling of how much data it can process uh on the production servers it's either 25 or 50 dollars a month per server um and depending on if it's a single core server or multi-core server but um, it, it's all designed to be really affordable. So $50 a month is, is actually really cheap compared to a lot of um, other products on the market that are more like $200 a month per server. Um, so, uh, you know, our goal is to make it affordable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, it, and my argument for, for this sort of product is that you know, these give you the answers to a lot of your issues. A lot faster, and for the likes of fifty dollars a month, you can't argue that the fact that yeah, I'm paying fifty dollars a month. But if I've got an issue and I've got four or five developers looking on at that, and it takes them a week to work out what it is, you know, that's a week's worth of, of hours for all four developers. That's a lot more than fifty dollars a month. Yeah, it's it's definitely a huge productivity tool, and and so people use our product for a couple different use cases. Some people. Um, you know, for, for that example of like, hey, we're, we're getting ready to do a big deployment and we want to make sure that we don't fail. Yep. You know, like you're talking about the travel site that you were, you were part of. Like, how do we use tools like ours to know that I'm going to do this big product release or this big deployment? And they're being very proactive, right? Um, so people use our product for those sort of use cases, but then they also use it for being reactive. They're like, oh, well, we do have a problem. We need to figure out what it, what's causing the problem, be it a, a big performance issue or or just a common bug in the system right it's like oh well a user says they go here click here click here and they get an error and we don't know what that is you know they can they can use our product to help find those errors and and dig in deeper to those things even though it's not necessarily a big outage it's just basic sort of troubleshooting where you might want to see your logs from production and what the errors are and and that the sort of stuff you do every day yeah yeah so we touched on that um, some of the your competitors charge a lot more than you do, but what makes Stackify stand out against the likes of Rapid Spike and App Dynamics and New Relic? Yeah, I, a lot of it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, where we're more focused on developers. Um, 
so you know, for example, like New Relic doesn't do application logging, and, and logging is one of the main things that developers want to see. And so logging is part of our software; it's part of our price. And um, so for fifty dollars a month, you know, that is included in the product. And um, we also don't have we don't require annual contracts where a lot of our competitors do. Yeah. A lot, a lot of them are two to three thousand dollars a year per server, and that's an annual contract. And ours actually we bill by the hour. You can actually use our product for an hour and turn it off and you'd only pay for that hour. Um, nobody does that, but they, they you could. Yeah. Um, but we, we bill by the hour because a lot of our customers will have, say, 10 servers during the day, but then at nighttime, they might shut some of those servers down. They, they scale down. And yeah, so yeah. they're able to save some money from that. But our, you know, how our product works is, is just much more focused on the developers and what they want to see. Um, you know, there's products like App Dynamics is a good example. I think you mentioned them. Yep. I think they have a, a great product for IT operations. System administrators love their product, but if uh, as a developer, it's it's not very user friendly. It's not it's not the kind of product you'd want to log into every day and look at your logs and what are the top errors in the system and how do I go troubleshoot those things. Like it's not really designed for that use case that the developers want to do. Um, and that and that's a lot of why we're different. Um, most of our customers are um, development teams that are working more in kind of a DevOps or NoOps kind of role where the developers are deploying their apps. They kind of own the monitoring of it, the the troubleshooting of it from kind of start to finish. And we're their eyes and ears the whole way. Yeah. Yeah, it, it sounds like um, for what I was using New Relic for the last time I used it, I think uh, Stackify probably would have been uh, maybe a, a better solution for it because i know that we spent a lot of time um i was the uh, the development team lead at the time uh, myself and the senior developer spent a lot of time trawling through their web api um uh, sorry their, their web ui to try and work out what the problem was what was the next slowest area in the site that we we should really tackle because there was uh, a monumental number of problems with the system and we were using it to uh, to find out what our next uh, our next big win was going to be? Which part of the system? And that that was always laborious. It was always very hard to do. So uh, being more developer orientated, maybe Stackify would have been uh, a better choice for that. Yeah, and that's our that's our goal is to help with those those kind of use case scenarios. And um, to us, we 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 always recommend clients um, if they can as part of their sprint planning to do what you mentioned. You know, always looking for what are my slowest parts of my application or the things that have the most errors, all that sort of stuff. And yep. slowly picking away at those, like every sprint, you know, we spend a few hours working on a, on a couple of those work items to always be improving performance and stay ahead of it. And, um, for a lot of people, it's hard to be proactive that way. They're, they're chasing something else, but it's, it's definitely best practice to always be kind of keeping an eye on those things and, and chipping away at them yeah. when they can. Yeah, definitely. Definitely is. Um, so if I want to get started with Stackify and Prefix, um, where where do I go f for that? Are they, uh, have you got a blog or uh, any video tutorials or anything like that that can uh, get me up and running? Yeah, we, we have a ton of great content on our website at stackify.com. And um, for Prefix, it's free. They can You can download it. And again, all you got to do is put in basically your email address and, and um, be up and running and play with it. Um, Retrace, uh, it's a free trial on our website, so you can install it on your server and um, play with it for a couple weeks and see what you think, see if you get some value out of it. Um, there, There's also, for Retrace, there's an online like live demo account that people can play with. You can go in and cl click around and poke around it and see how it works. And then we have online demos and stuff like that, too. Um, a lot of people that maybe don't know exactly who we are or our products probably have been to our blog before. We get over half a million visitors a month on our blog. Um, we have tons of blog posts about things like .NET logging best practices and what is APM and all those sort of things. So sure. I would I would, I would would get bet most of the people listening to this that will have been to our blog even if they don't even know it. <laughs> um, but we, we have a huge um, set of resources on our blog about all sorts of things around application performance and best practices for sure. True. And I get to that through uh, stackify.com. Yep, yep. yep. So stack cool. I will uh, link to to all of that uh, in the uh, in the show notes as well, so uh, people can uh, can get to it quickly. 
So um, what's what's happening with Stackify? What's exciting in the uh, in the near future for it? Is there anything big coming along that uh, that people should be aware of? Yeah, we we just continue to grow. Um, you know, the we kind of see the market so much of the application performance management space and those vendors have been focused on IT operations and the large enterprises. And it's made products like ours not very affordable, kind of, kind of like you mentioned. Like you guys had New Relic, but it was so expensive and you didn't have it on every server and you didn't have it in every environment. And yep. um, our goal has just been to make it uh, more developer friendly and, and more affordable for especially small and medium sized companies. You know, these really large companies, okay, they'll pay $100,000 a year for New Relic or something and they, you know, whatever. But for a small dev team, like that's just an absurd amount of money that nobody would pay. And yeah. um, that, you know, that's a lot of our customers are, are those small teams. And, you know, this year we've about tripled in size. Um, we, we really continue to grow and, you know, we'll probably triple next year as well. And um, our, our big goals for next year are to um, expand some of our programming language support and, um, just some of the some of the different features and do more to help developers around their deployments and uh, knowing how those deployments are going and better reporting around them and you know to us that uh, developers kind of live from deployment to deployment to deployment and you know how can we help them um, validate that they're going to have a good deployment and before they do it and then validate that they deployment did go well after it's done and yeah that's that's kind of the the world we live in is, is trying to help developers in that area sure cool yeah it sounds uh sounds exciting and it sounds interesting i think if if more of these products come along because i have played a little bit uh with uh with prefix i think when it first came out um i uh i had a, a play around with it and uh, it, it was pretty good um so anything that you can uh, bring to the table to make my life easier as a developer then definitely definitely interested in uh, in all that sort of stuff yeah, absolutely. That, and that's our goal. Yeah, it's trying to help people be more productive and uh, uh, hopefully not be up late at night putting out production fires if they can stay ahead of these problems. Now, now there's a thought. Not putting out fires. <laughs> uh, actually concentrating on some uh, some new development and not running around like a headless chicken. There's, yeah, there, well, there's something for us all to aspire to. Well, I mean, that's where that's where this all started. I, before this, I had a, another company called Vin Solutions, V-I-N Solutions, and I was the founder of that, and uh, we we sold that company, and um, it we were very high growth. And when I left, we had about forty software developers at the time, and yep. I felt like myself and two or three of our lead developers who had been there a long time. That was the problem. We spent all of our time, you know, looking at log files in production, you know, chasing fires around trying to trying to solve these issues and debug them and troubleshoot them and so we had 40 other developers but we didn't have any of the tools that we needed to do any of this stuff and yeah. and it was just a huge waste of our time putting out those fires when we should have been working on more strategic stuff more you know product stuff to move the company forward yeah um and then yeah it's awesome that that's what we've been able to build and that's the problem we're trying to solve is you know trying to relieve that stress and getting more people involved in production monitoring and support and it's, it's kind of a DevOps, no op sort of thing. You know, it's getting the developers more involved in, you know, operations and troubleshooting and performance monitoring and all that stuff, letting them own that and have better visibility to it. Yeah, sure. And for anybody out there that was trying to think, how, how do I go into work tomorrow and, uh, and sell this to, to, uh, to my dev manager that, that Matt just said that that's your reason. That is exactly why. Because you can free up your developers to actually develop stuff rather than them spending days and weeks and months just chasing around those little bugs that are causing you, you know, absolute nightmares. You know, it, uh, it makes that whole process so much easier. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing to me. A lot of the people we talk to have cobbled together kind of their weird own monitoring systems like they... They log all their own errors in a SQL database somewhere, or they log all their logging statements in a SQL database, or yeah. um, they use all these different mixtures of tools, which are great. But um, you know, the problem I had at our at, at my last company is we logged our errors to a SQL database, which a lot of people did. But you know, when we looked at them, never. <laughs> Only when our SQL database was running out of disk space because there were so <laughs> many errors in the freaking table. Yeah. And I was like, well, before I purge this table, I better look at these for a minute. Yeah. 
but there was so much data in there it was so unwieldy to do anything with and that that was the problem that that sort of data shouldn't live in sql server that's not a good place for that data and so we you know that's why we store it all in elastic search and we have great you know indexing and searching and all that sort of stuff um around all the data and can uniquely identify an error and how often that error that specific error has happened and what environments it's happened in and all those sort of things so yeah, it's helping you make make sense of uh, of those logs and uh, and those stats. Because you know, I've done it before. Um, I've built exception management uh, modules that log to a SQL database. If they don't log to a SQL database, they uh, they email it out. And if they can't get to an email, then they log it to a file on the server. And those SQL files, uh, the SQL records in the database, were never looked at. The emails were automatically filtered out to a folder, which were never looked at. And uh, nobody ever went and looked at the actual text um, files. Um, so it, they were pointless. It was taking yeah. up storage in inboxes, SQL uh, server, and uh, on the web servers for absolutely no benefit at all. Yeah, you get it. I mean, the, the email part of that is, is always so funny because it's like, oh, we can set this up and it'll email me when we get an error. And, and that's great until one day you get like 10,000 emails in an hour. Yeah, and then the next thing you know, you're like you said, you set up some kind of rule and uh, Outlook or something to to filter them out, and and then you get all these errors that just happen all the time, and they're like just noise. They're like, yeah. we know about this thing, but nobody's gonna fix it. It just happens, and you know, at least in our software, you can log in and uh, mark that error as like ignore, like so it you never see it again. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we so we do email alerts and um, SMS alerts and stuff like that. But we only send out one alert when there's a new error. We don't send it out for every instance of that error. Sure. And so yeah, we you know we we can definitely help solve all of those problems. Yeah. Yeah. Th this conversation just making me feel like a bad developer because it's brought something else up that I, that I hadn't thought about for a while. Um. With my uh, exception manager module. Um. That uh, in the email part of it that um, we turned off the login to the database and it would send the emails out instead. But there was an exception after it sent the email and it entered an infinite loop and it would send an exception email <laughs> out every, after everyone and it, uh, it clogged up the um, the exchange server for uh, for about two days. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that one. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah. I think maybe I need to find a different industry <laughs> and go, go, go and uh, do something else. It's, yeah, uh, and what... And what part of what makes us unique is because we do all these things together, you can actually go from an error and see the full trace that that transaction was part of. So it's like, you know, here's here's what URL it was, the database queries that happened, all your logging statements, and then there was an error at the end of that request. And so being able to see all of those things together in one little snapshot is really, really priceless as a developer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I can definitely see the uh, the worth in that. It's uh, it'd be good. I think uh, the next time I I need a solution like this, I think I'll be uh, jumping to to Stackify to say you know, let 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 let's run this. Let's see uh, see what we've got going on uh, going on with the system. Yeah, well, love love to have you try it and, and uh, get your feedback. You know, we um, we have customers in over fifty different countries, which still kind of blows my mind. As uh, you know, we're here, we're here in the Midwest in the U.S. and um, I know you're where are you at in England. Yeah, I'm just over the border in North Wales, actually. So, um, okay. north, north, northwest England, uh, North Wales, just uh, just right on the edge. So, uh, I don't have the Welsh accent. If you go another sort of five or six miles uh, inland down the coast a little bit more, um, you get the Welsh accent. Uh, whereas, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, don't have the Welsh accent. So, just on the border. Okay. Yeah, it's it's just amazing to me. You know, there's there's software developers everywhere you know i mentioned we get a lot of traffic on our website we get traffic every week from every single country in the world um which is just crazy yeah. so it just just shows how much uh, software development is such a a huge thing across the entire world it de definitely does and you're solving a specific issue and having that many people in that many countries coming to you for it shows that you are um providing a solution for a very common problem which uh i think solidifies uh, the reason to have your product yeah yep absolutely cool it's definitely fun yeah yeah and uh, i think before before we started recording this podcast uh we were talking uh about 
other up and coming things. And we uh, we spoke very briefly that uh, you were going to be starting a Stackify podcast. Yeah, that's right. We so we just recorded the first episode of it. We haven't published it yet, but um, sometime over the next couple of weeks, I think we'll probably publish our first podcast, and it's it's going to be all Stackify related, and um, we'll probably be covering a lot of content that's around application performance and monitoring and best practices and, and all that uh, those sort of topics. And um, yeah, really excited to uh, to do that and um, have some of our customers on and, and other people around the industry that kind of live and breathe these these topics and have these same sort of problems and should be fun yeah yeah it definitely sounds uh sounds interesting and it'd be another uh, another podcast to add to uh, to my uh subscription list but uh, when that does go live if you let me know i shall stick it uh, on the website i'll push it out over over social media as well and um i, I look forward to uh, to listening to it yeah absolutely i'm excited to Okay. I'm so excited. So yeah, yeah, fantastic. So t- thanks for uh, for coming on and talking to us about Stackify. Um, it's been uh, been good to have you on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Not a problem. And uh, thanks to uh, to everyone out there. You know, thank you to uh, for listening to the Cynical Developer. I'm James Studdart, and you've been listening to Matt Watson talking about Stackify. If you have any questions about this or any other episode, then drop us an email, a tweet, or leave a comment on the website where you can find all the resource links, show notes for each episode. And if you enjoy this episode, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Stitch, whatever it is, and help the cynical developer to reach more developers around the globe.